Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to our special session for the 2021 PMLA. Um, our session is called Teaching Intersectionality Through Literature, Hawaii, the Pacific and Beyond. Um, today we have four great speakers that are you know, covering a whole different array of different kinds of topics within intersectionality and in terms of teaching literature. Um, and ours is a round table. So the presentations will be a, a bit shorter, but we'll have a lot of time for kind of conversations and informal conversations afterwards. So if you do have questions, um, please feel free to, to send them in the chat so that you know you don't forget them. And then we can make sure to cover those questions once we kind of get into the more interactive um, part of our presentation. Okay, um, our first speaker today is Miguel Ramon. Um, let me give you a little short bio for him. Miguel Ramon re recently completed his PhD in English from the University of California, Irvine. His interest, in, uh, his interest is in English education, specifically developing lessons and researching techniques that transform the values of inclusion and equity into pedagogical action. Um, he began teaching after high school um, in Los Angeles for over a decade. Uh, Miguel employs intersectionality as a framework for exploring the aesthetic, aesthetic power in drama, an approach initially developed in the teaching of um, Hansbury's A Raisin in the Sun as a high school English instructor, and a method he continues to use in his current literature courses today. Um, Miguel's presentation today is called Intersectionality and Identity Through Hansbury's A Raisin in the Sun. Um, and I give, I'll, I'll give the floor over to Miguel. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Yes, seven years in the making, and I am the beyond part of this presentation. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, I hope I hope you find it helpful. I'm since I'm a former teacher, this is this is meant to be very teacher friendly, uh, and hopefully give you a sense of empowerment of, of, of taking something I do and using it for what you want. So let's dive in. Let me make sure this works. Uh, can you guys see my? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Great. Let me know if any time if I move off that screen from it. Um, you guys can still see it? Okay, good, just double checking. Sometimes Zoom is a little quanky and it, it, it kicks me right off the PowerPoint when I load it. All right. Um, so uh, intersectionality as a concept uh, and drama as a literary field share an essential element. Uh, understanding and illustrating the forces that shape a person's identity, specifically aspects of identity that society traditionally fails to consider. The catharsis or sustained emotional awareness that drama invokes through spectacle and dialogue provides the perfect dynamic vehicle for an audience to appreciate the un unconsidered relationship between interconnected social forces. My presentation today will highlight how to incorporate intersectionality as a character analysis tool to understand the effectiveness in which Hansberry is raising in the sun creates a powerful catharsis that enables the audience to understand the lived experience of Jim Crow during the 1960s. One of the many benefits of this approach is that intersectionality becomes a literary tool and not the end in itself. This method prevents one of the common problems associated with teaching theory, that the idea itself becomes more important than the understanding of lived reality it seeks to explain. I have used this character analysis for over a decade. I've never met, had any issues with students who might've been triggered by discussion centering on identity, partly because the approach places the drama itself at the center of my practice. My approach will, co will coach students to closely read critical scenes of the drama, to play theater critic, and assess how effective actors' choices are in realizing the complex emotional life world of systemic racism. I wanna highlight how I work through the concept of the drama to demonstrate the pedagogy that uses Crenshaw's prism to highlight Hansberry's genius. Um, to begin, uh, I introduced the concept of what Kimberly Crenshaw calls a useful metaphor. Uh, before students begin the drama, I introduce the intersectionality as a concept um, uh, to get students to unpack the term and begin to appropriate it for their own uses. I want to give students more than one, uh, one way to grasp the idea. I want them to see it as a way to decode the, author, authors, the actor's choices in their performance and explain the extensive stage direction Hansberry provides. The first step is simple. Have students watch a brief video in which Professor Crenshaw defines intersectionality. Let's watch just a little clip of this video now. Let's make sure this works. Let me know if you can't hear it. Intersectionality is just a metaphor 
for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not uh, we watched the whole clip, obviously, but you can see how it's, its brevity is both helpful because it's so short and so clear about what intersectional, intersectionality is. It's a good introduction. Um, as Just students, race problem is um, excuse me. As students share their first definitions of the term, the um, uh, excuse me, immediately following the video, I ask students in dyads to complete the definition card. That's my figure A on the left. And it sits on their table ordinarily, so everyone sees it while they're writing it, while everyone's speaking. As students share their first definition of the term, the repetition and revision of the pair share provides needed clarity for the concept. Immediately following the pair share, I ask the same dyads to redefine intersectionality. This time I require them to incorporate one or two key phrases from the transcript of the video I showed. So there's the, the thing queued up for them and it gives them into a really complex, really quick complex understanding of the term. The repetition or revision provided depth in understanding the term by creating and hearing several critical phrases integrated into their initial definition. In less than 20 minutes, students are prepared to do what Crenshaw asks in the video. Students can identify and begin to analyze moments in which the convergence of stereotypes helps the audience understand intersectionality that comprises the challenge of unpacking Jim Crow, a challenge made visible by Hansberry's rhetorical choices and present and, uh, and, and, and excuse me, um, made visible by Hansberry's rhetorical choices to present and challenge stereotypes through the drama. Um, students are now armed with the prism by which to examine the way the characters in the drama reveal the cumulative effect of identity shaping forces can begin to analyze the drama rhetorically. After reading each act of the play um, before class, students work in small groups to present different intersectional moments in a raisin in the sun. The, question will, the questions I provide will aid students as they narrate a close reading of their scene for the class. There's my figure three. The small groups then lead the class through a rhetorical analysis of moments from scenes that highlight how Hansberry's choices as a dramatist unpack the intersectional forces that help the audience develop a feeling-based knowledge of Jim Crow. The analysis is not reductive. Students go beyond naming forces. Instead, the convergences are analyzed to understand how they shape each character. Scene one uh, opens to introduce the younger family living in the red line, south side of Chicago. The family's patriarch has recently died but left a $10,000 insurance check to provide for his family. I did that just in case anyone hadn't read the play. <laughs> uh, the tension of the drama centers on how to invest the unexpected windfall. The daily routines that explore this question from bathroom sharing to living in cramped quarters permit the audience to see how the expression of intersectional forces emerges from the daily routines of American life. For example, scene one complicates the audience's understanding of the lived experience of Jim Crow by having Ruth and Walter fight. On the surface level, the row is about the type of eggs to have for breakfast and if Travis, their son, can have 50 cents for school. Underneath the surface, of a typical would-be day is the intersection of several social conditions driving the internal conflict of each character. For instance, Walter's experience as a chauffeur provides him access to what the American dream looks like when it's not deferred, and Walter desperately wants to break out beyond the racially based stereotype of driving Miss Daisy. This passion, the drama will reveal, stems from Walter's desire to be a man in the eyes of his wife and son. Notions of manhood and labor identity intersect with racially prescribed ideas of identity that lead Walter to damn all the eggs that ever were. And that's a terrible version of it. Let's listen to a much better version of that scene now. I'm looking in the mirror this morning. I'm thinking I'm 35 years old. I'm married 11 years. And I got a boy who's got to sleep in the living room because I got nothing. Hey, nothing to give him but stories. Like on how rich white people live, eh? Eat your eggs, Walter. Damn these eggs. Damn all the eggs that ever was. And go. Um, uh, <clears throat> students get to work through how these feelings are expressed in the context of the family. Intersectional forces working through members of the same family differently, complicating the audience's understanding of Jim Crow. The next group will, uh, will closely read Travis or Benny's actions in the scene. And we'll point, um, if the group analyzing Travis, for example, will point out that the school lurks in the anxiety that motivates Travis to ask his mother for 50 cents. The stereotype scene unpacks the emergence uh, excuse me, the stereotype the scene unpacks emerges from Travis's fear that the teacher will see him, quote, as a poor black boy who cannot bring the required money for the school trip. 
The norming power of school as an intersectional force is reinforced when Ruth reminds Travis to comb his hair because it looks like, quote, a chicken coop. Ruth's comments ensure that Travis's natural curliness is seen as undesirable and reveals Ruth's complicated role as a mother trying to raise a healthy son. Ruth draws from her awareness of how European-based beauty norms work in the larger culture. These norms require African-Americans to internalize a distaste for more natural African modes of being, typified in the drama by the politicization of hair. Travis's curly hair, Ruth fears, would reinforce the stereotypes that Travis also fears his lack of money would emphasize. The fight between Ruth and Travis works as, as, as various intersectional identities come into conflict in each scene. Students unpack the scene of the class and help explain the unspoken motivation for the characters. So they would, while the scene that I just played play, they play it and then I stop and pause and then they work us through these forces kind of like I just did now. <clears throat> After the first act, students are equipped with enough character knowledge to delineate the forces that shape the character. Figure four illustrates the character analysis individual students will do before we read act two. The activity requires students to first name at least three intersectional forces for one specific character. But this naming pushes the students back into the drama. Now each student must explain how the drama represents these forces by finding references in the play. Through the play's characterization, the students can now describe how external forces move through an individual's character's actions. This rarely seen aspect of identifying identity building that play highlights gets the, the very heart of intersectionality, detailing the blind spots noted by social inequality. And, and, and the students get a lot out of this particular activity um, because it requires them to name it and get and connect it to the text. And we come back whole class to, to discuss them as characters. By act three, students can now map the rhetorical choices, the spectacle, the stage direction, and the dialogue to understand how these choices enable an audience who might otherwise miss the problematic convergences. In doing so, intersectionality becomes the way which the drama can be understood. The last activity I have students do is to demonstrate the complexity of, 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 the, of the life world of Jim Crow, is to analyze a critical moment from the drama, Walter's would-be minstrelsy to recover the lost insurance money for his family. Um, in the drama, Walter, against his mother's wishes, has foolishly invested most of the insurance payout to start a liquor store uh, business with friends. After being conned out of the money by one of those friends, Walter wants the plan to recoup some of the money. Walter considers selling the house that his mother had purchased back to the neighborhood association, a group that had already offered to buy the house from the youngers um, in hopes of continuing the redlining housing segregation practices of Clyburn Park. Walter's recovery plan includes, quote, putting on a show or enacting racialized stereotypes for the neighborhood association president, Mr. Linder. While both versions we watch in class, Cindy 4861 and Walter um, and Danny Glover's 89 Walter work well, Danny Glover's non-abridged version of this scene will help support the class's use of intersectionality as a character analysis tool. Figure five demonstrates all the different forms of oppression and exploitation that can drive, the, drive Walter to the verge of enacting a moment of minstrelsy. And this is the real reason I created this activity when I was a high school teacher. Students would get to this scene where Danny Glover mimes, almost puts on blackface as part of the performative nature. And the students wouldn't understand the power of that choice. And, how, and, and my whole approach was how could we get students aware in order to really understand the dynamic moment that, that this, this part of the play unfolds. So here my activity makes them make all those connections literally by, 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 by seeing the, the, the realities of a mental show, by having discussed redlining, by being aware of all the moments that have gone into the play, they can now see these intersections through, care, through this moment of powerful choice. Um, figure five, um, excuse me, uh, demonstrates all the different forms, um, which are Walter's awareness of minstrelsy, minstrel's history by miming several famous and repeated lines from the minstrel show. Walter's notion of masculine identity understood through the pearls he believed his wife should have. Walter's family in the historical context of being the descendant of slaves and sharecroppers, represented by the sixth generation of his family in Travis. With these forces understood, the result is an intensity that allows the audience a moment of insight. A felt experience uh, of what Du Bois calls dogged strength that alone keeps Walter from being torn asunder. Walter's characterization is a powerful portrayal of the strife that originates Du Bois's concept of double consciousness, a convergence that finds complete expression in Crenshaw's prism of intersectionality. And I have a, 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 if I have the time, I have one minute of that scene queued up that we could watch. Okay. I want to make sure I, if I was long, I don't want to. Hand and you won't have to live next to this bunch. 
just can't get nigga. And maybe, maybe I just get down on my knees. And I say, hey, 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 Captain, good Captain Boss Man. Hey, 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 yes, sir. Yes, sir, great white father. Hey, JC. Hey, Give me the, some of that money for God's sake. <laughs> yeah. And you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna have to, to worry about us moving in your white neighborhood. So the, the, the power of the scene really requires the students to become aware of the intersectional forces to express it. And it transforms the teaching of the play. And it was one of those transformative moments that I got as a high school teacher that's, cut, that's carried me up with me. And I still use it because students still respond so powerfully to it. Lastly, um, the visualized moments accompanying their dialogue permit students to understand Walter as a realistic yet sympathetic figure whose moments of intersectionality are the primary way audience achieve catharsis. I hope that my examples help illustrate how robust intersectional character analysis can be for students and professors. While I focus today on making intersectional character analysis clear, I, I want to emphasize that, that it leads to really fun activities because they have such a good reading of the forces in the characters. And so we have the Battle of the Joseph, which Joseph is sexier in the 6189 version. We can do that because of our close reading. We've got the, um, uh, the battle, we, we've got the, uh, the, the fall of Walter. And it, we're, we're really able to then go back over critical moments, specifically the scene where Walter uh, returns to Africa and does his war dance in complete context now that we see where it's going to lead. So we go back afterwards and do this great stuff with the play because of this intersectional work. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Miguel. Um, again, for, for all of our kind of um, participants and audiences, um, if you have any questions, feel free to kind of leave them in the chat and I'll make sure that we'll, we'll, we'll cover any questions you might have uh, when we do open it up for Q&A. Okay, um, our next speaker is Janet Graham. Um, here's a short bio on Janet. So Janet earned her PhD in English with a literary studies concentration from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2019 for her dissertation that examines Vietnamese diasporic literature. Uh, she joined the English department at the University of Nebraska at Kearney in August, 2020. Uh, her, in, her teaching interests include multi-ethnic American literature, migration narratives, and anti-racist education. Uh, Janet's presentation today is titled The Fire Next Time, Anti-Racist Pedagogy and Rhetorical Analysis at a Predominantly White Institution. Um, okay, uh, Janet, the, the, once I make you the co-host really quickly, the floor will be yours. Great. Okay. Just a sec, I gotta get my PowerPoint open. And then, then we're all set. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay, great. All right. So thank you, Mike, um, for organizing this panel. Um, great to see some of my UH, P, uh, UH Manoa PhD alumni. I see you there, Scott, if you're still there. Um, so I'm joining you from the Great Plains of Nebraska, where I teach secondary English methods, English composition, and multi-ethnic American literature, among other areas at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. And like um, Miguel did, um, the title of our roundtable references place, and I'm also from the beyond. Um, so I want to provide a sense of, of where I am um, writing from, so or what I'm where I'm speaking from. So Kearney is on the Platte River. Um, it is the traditional home of the Pawnee, according to the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma website. After encroachment by white settlers, the Pawnee decided they ceded their territory to the US government in the 1800s and were removed from Nebraska um, to what is now Pawnee County in 1887, which is in Oklahoma. 
Um, as a new faculty in a new place, I'm in a separate and connected space emotionally, sometimes simultaneously. Um, in a text I wrote to a friend who was checking in on me, I responded that I'm learning that social emotional intelligence is paramount when confronting the evidence of racial injustice and trauma. So my contribution to our roundtable, um, you know, references a predominantly white institution and also the Midwestern US. Um, and I suppose I meant to suggest that that was a challenge um, that I'm facing to, to deal with anti-racist pedagogy in a predominantly white institution. Um, and so I'm relying on Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality and James Baldwin's writing um, to be ready for the challenge. Um, James, Baldwin, James Baldwin's words, especially in the, right in the fire next time, are helping me develop a teaching praxis that combines anti-racist pedagogy with an intersectional exploration of identity. And it actually has informed all of my work in all the classes that I'm teaching. Um, though my abstract <laughs> promise to offer an extended discussion of the role of ethnic literature um, in promoting anti-racist pedagogy, I, I ended up focusing on James Baldwin um, for, for this whole presentation, just because he's so powerful. Um, so what, what we're looking at is um, the effect that he had on my first year composition students. Um, later at the end, I'll mention what I could be talking about in our conversation later. Um, elaborating on the meaning of intersectionality in 1991, Kimberly Crenshaw clarifies that her focus on the intersections of race and gender only highlights the need to account for multiple grounds of identity when considering how the social world is constructed. So um, I'm so glad that Miguel um, really delved into um, you know, the, central, the central core of her work, but I'm sort of like going onto the margins of it um, right now and a little bit of what she's been doing recently. Um, so, but this insight that, that I include from 1991, I feel is foundational for anti-racist and social justice work because it serves to highlight the vitality of her ideas as we continue to explore the full implications of intersectionality as a reflective tool. Um, as she explains in the introduction to her new podcast, Intersectionality Matters, her listeners may be able to understand, quote, their own lives in deeper and nuanced ways by being able to unpack the mul multiple forms of oppression, et cetera, and how, how they form our, our world. Um, as I will show, James Baldwin's work models personal reflection about race, gender, and identity that is accessible to first-year students and allows me to introduce intersectionality to them. Through personal reflection and rhetorical analysis, my composition students embark on the work of integrating their constituent parts into their own racial, ethnic, cultural identities. According to Beverly Daniel Tatum, this is a lifelong process. And Baldwin depicts it vividly in his fiction and essays, but in The Fire Next Time, he focuses on teaching readers how to approach their own journeys. Learning the lessons that Baldwin teaches in these letters starts with personal reflection about identity, which students and teachers alike must bring to the classroom. Because part of my anti-racist pedagogy involves sharing my identity journey with my students, I want to share how reading shaped my racial, ethnic, cultural identity as a female second generation college graduate WASP settler growing up in the Seattle area. Above all, I identified as a reader, even in elementary school. And I actually think it's fair to say that reading helped me begin to think about race and guided my path toward anti-racism. My free reading choices in fifth grade illuminated the truth that white people were responsible for slavery and its awful legacy. And I felt ashamed to be a white person because of that. Most influential were narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, and Mildred Taylor's Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. I doubt I understood the entire horror of Douglass's experience, but I remember being terrified that he had to risk severe punishment to read, but I was also thrilled by his daring. And I think I also saw Miss Sophia as a potential ally. This reading prepared me to investigate the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
when his birthday became a national holiday about two weeks before my 13th birthday. And then he became my hero as a person who embodied a great tradition of fighting for social justice in the church. Right around that time, I was confirmed in the Lutheran church and I was a person of faith. I even contemplated studying theology. Though I, can't, I couldn't articulate it then, um, both the hold that the church had on me and my reasons for leaving the church have strong parallels to what Baldwin, a one-time teenage preacher, calls out in the fire next time. In contrast to King, I find that James Baldwin reaches people at a more visceral and personal level, and then he makes them take a good long look at themselves and the nation, and that is precisely why we read him. In the fall of 2020, um, my first term here at the University of Kearney, my students in an honor section of academic writing and research read and discussed James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time as the main text for their work with rhetorical analysis. It also addressed our course theme, which was ever widening circles, identity and place. Due to COVID-19 prevention protocols, we wore masks and had a hybrid face-to-face -face online setup. It was a class of only seven students, five young women and two young men. Six of the students in the class are white. One young woman is biracial with an African-American father and a white mother. One young man is bisexual. He came out to our class uh, later um, after we read Baldwin. Um, having such a small class made the work we would do with Baldwin quite intense. First, we read and discuss my Dungeon Shook letter to my nephew on the 100th anniversary of the emancipation. Every student is drawn in right away because he is addressing his teenage nephew and they wanna know what's going on with him. They all feel like they know this young man, but then they learn how their lives diverge. While he is facing a racist America of 1963, they are dealing with a pandemic. After their initial identification with James the nephew, they get increasingly uncomfortable as they continue to read until Baldwin makes a rhetorical move that earns their trust in response to protests that he is exaggerating about the conditions in Harlem. He writes to his nephew, they do not know Harlem and I do, so do you. Take no one's word for anything, including mine, but trust your own experience. In this ethical proof, he communicates that he knows the truth with his own eyes, but he isn't going to pretend to understand exactly what the younger James experiences. In this gesture, he places the gorgeous struggle to define thyself in his nephew's hands, while importantly, he juxtaposes this journey in relation to the people who love him against a backdrop of people who don't care to know of his existence and struggles. In this moment, he invites my students to explore their own relational identities. Um, but then after they read Down at the Cross, the second and longer essay and responded to a few preliminary questions, I could see they weren't getting his full message or they couldn't communicate it. Um, so we tried a silent discussion protocol. In it, they read each other's answers and add to them in writing. Once each question has gone around the room, the last person summarizes what the others wrote. We don't use names, and we ground our work with a quote from Audre Lorde, where she writes, I learned so much from listening to people. And all I knew was the only thing I had was honesty and openness. I credit Shauna Young Ryan, a creative faculty at, the, at UH Manoa uh, for the silent discussion protocol idea. Part of the reason for the silent discussion is to avoid pressuring students to act as cultural translators for their classmates. Okay, thanks. Um, whoops, sorry, um, for their classmates. With the silent discussion, I push all of them to read Baldwin closely and honestly as they seek, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I lost my place, just a sec. Um, well, anyway, okay. So many of them, they buy the watered down version of Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, their favorite quotes, from Dr. King's speech are about a colorblind society where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Because they want to believe that America is just and that race as a social contract does not matter. Um, so of course they do, right? It's a nice idea, but it's just not honest. So they don't see themselves or us as the nation we are, not like Baldwin does when he writes, it is the innocence 
which constitutes the crime. But they begin to see that it isn't about white people accepting non-white people or white people telling others they are good enough. Baldwin invites white people to look at themselves and join the world without the security of white privilege, understanding that whoever debases others is debased himself. Um, perhaps they get an inkling of how Baldwin is reformulating the theme of acceptance when he tells his nephew that there is no basis whatever for their important assumption that they must accept you. The really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them. The theme hits home when I ask them to analyze the following quote from Down at the Cross. I watch as realization dawns upon them. The quote reads, why, for example, especially knowing the family as I do, I should want to marry your daughter is a great mystery to me, but your, excuse me, not your daughter, your sister, but your sister and I, and I have every right to marry if we wish to, and no one has the right to stop us. If she cannot raise me to her level, perhaps I can raise her to mine. This discussion of the bonds of love are very relatable to my students. So I'm going to finish by talking about one student um, who was, was really affected by reading this work by Baldwin. Um, he decided to research the rebranding of Aunt Jemima syrup as, as his topic for our second paper, which was what's in a name exploratory research assignment. Because one of his family members had been making fun of changing um, the names of racist products. Um, and so he researched the whole thing. And this is his conclusion. It is one thing to recognize that slavery occurred and that Aunt Jemima was a brand that used the image of, a black, of black slave labor to sell a product. But this is different from continuing to support this brand. Um, and so I, I was interested in the work he had done there. And then a few months later, um, he emailed me to let me know that PepsiCo had changed the name to Pearl Milling Company. Um, so I replied to him and asked if he felt relieved and whether the company had righted the wrong in his view. Um, and he replied that he didn't have a sense of resolution. And he added that he doesn't think they could fully right the wrong. Um, he said there will always be a room for improvement. And he you know, urged any company that had racist brands to begin by changing the names. Um, and what I heard in this statement is that he had become personally invested in anti-racism, that it was part of his it, it was becoming part of his identity. Um, and this really struck me, um, this idea of repair really struck me when I was listening to one of Crenshaw's podcasts um, where she brings Brian Stevenson into the conversation. Um, and S Stevenson says that um, there are stories, excuse me, just a second. Um, Stevenson says that um, we need honest storytelling that can reach mainstream audiences with the possibility of repairing the damage that false narratives have, have done. These are the stories we need to move this nation to something that feels more like freedom, feels more like justice, feels more like equality. But we have to be bold if we're going to achieve that. So I connect Stevenson's idea um, to this student's expectation that those who hold the power over national narratives must make amends partly by rejecting the racist script they have been using. Um, and so if, you, if I need to stop, I can stop now, but I, I wouldn't mind adding one little part, but let me know. Maybe just, just yeah, one last wrap up. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Baldwin's work is intersectional because it helps readers create a fuller a fuller, more complex picture of themselves and others. He invites each person to investigate their fears, insecurities, and anger to be real with themselves. Um, as my students became aware of their complex identities based on race, gender, sexual orientation, and religion, many of my students who are professed Christians and comfortable talking about their faith pay careful attention to Baldwin's critique of the church's failure to grapple with America's sin of not knowing about how others suffer on purpose as a result of a white supremacist system. He constructs an ultimatum for Christians when he states, if the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only to be us to make us larger, freer, 
and more loving. I am right there with Baldwin as I challenge my students to think about how to respond to the challenge. I trust that the intense gaze he trains on the reader will inspire intersectional and reflective reading. Um, these, just really quick, are the is the literature I use in other courses. Thank you so much for listening. Sorry, I went a little long. Um, there's my email if you want to get in touch because I'd love to talk about this. I didn't give credit for these pictures because these are ones I've taken um, in Nebraska. There's my work cited. Thanks again. All right, thank you, Janet. Um, our third speaker today is uh, Kimberly Jew. And let me give her, her a short little file. Um, Kimberly Jew joint, holds a joint appointment in theater and ethnic studies and serves as program head for theater teaching at the University of Utah. She teaches a wide range of topics ranging from Asian American and ethnic American studies to theater theory, dramatic literature, educational theater, and script analysis. Currently, she is a co-editor for Frontiers, a journal of women's studies. Uh, Kimberly's um, presentation today is entitled Intersectionality and Otherness in a Creative Writing Class. Um, Kimberly, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mai. Thanks, everyone. Um, I put a student poem in the chat that I'm hoping to wrap up with at the end. It's called Manave, uh, which means breath in Samoan, and it's by one of the students in this class that I'm going to talk about. So, um, as you know, my talk is titled Intersectionality and Otherness in a Creative Writing Class. And I'd like to share with you a class I've created at the University of Utah, currently titled Ethnic American Story Making. So having toggled for five years between theater and ethnic studies, the two departments that make up my joint appointment, I wanted to develop a class that offered an intellectual and creative bridge between the two departments. I felt that my ethnic studies students would benefit from more freedom of form, perhaps a little bit more joy, a release from studying forms of aggregate inequities. While my theater students who are predominantly white, as you would imagine, um, would benefit from a deeper understanding of how race, ethnicity, and gender intersect at deep and complex levels in the formation of an individual's identity and daily life experiences. So my class seeks to make a connection between the constructed na nature of a narrative with the constructive nature of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and other social features that live precariously on the spectrum between normalized and universal on one side and abnormal and minoritized on the other side. So an important feature of my class is that students write in the first person in the voice of an individual who is different from themselves. This is an especially sensitive point in theater and film, as you know, the issue of casting a white actor in the role of a non-white character is historic and continues to undergo intense scrutiny. And of course, this, this relates clearly to classroom exercises, right? Can you do August Wilson in an acting class when you don't have any black actors? It's a sensitive part in question. Um, the current best practice in casting diversity is defined as identity conscious casting in which a person's total intersectional makeup is engaged as part of their potential contribution to a role. So if Julius Caesar is played by a heterosexual presenting Latino, a really tall man from the South with a speech impediment, what does this total composition of layered identity bring to the development of that character in this production? So this newer system of casting, being identity conscious casting, differs from the previous color conscious casting and color blind casting, which were previous efforts to grapple with this issue of, you know, who can play a character that is not white. So to engage with these developing artistic conversations about the complexities of identities, uh, students are asked to explore otherness in their creative writing exercises and the final project, and to actively seek to excavate the potential truths of voices, lives, and cultures that do not belong to them. So naturally, early on in this class, we discuss what constitutes transracial writing and cultural appropriation. We read two essays by Nisi Shaw titled, Beautiful Strangers and Appropriate Cultural Appropriation. I have also been tutored most recently by Paisley Rectal's new book titled Appropriate and plan to integrate this text into course assignments in the future. 
Rechtel suggests that cultural appropriation occurs the moment when negative stereotypes and racialized innuendos are deployed in the performance of the object or practice. And she gives the example of a photograph of a white high school student wearing a traditional Chinese chong song to her senior prom. And this is, in itself is not cultural appropriation, she argues, but the moment the girl poses for a photo, tilts her head, presses her hands together and squints her eyes, questions of cultural appropriation emerge. So having students write stories from the perspective of characters who are different from themselves is intended to be a process of learning more so than the creation of a perfect product. And I find that the conversations that emerge as students read each other's work and offer peer reviews and share their own personal perspectives on the construction of story and character are really eye-opening. For instance, I currently have a white female student who chose to write her final project on a male character who is biracial, black, and Japanese. Clearly a bold choice to be sure. She has had to conduct research on Japanese culture, racism, and language, and explore the emerging scholarship on Blasian identities. In her current draft of the story, which is in its second draft, um, as a point of background information, a Black American serviceman leaves his pregnant Japanese girlfriend in Japan. And no, I have not mentioned to her yet that this echoes Pinkerton in Madame Butterfly, but I will mention this to her eventually, um, just to get her to think. A student in class who was Black, who was assigned to peer review this work in progress, noted to this writer that the image of an absent Black father borders on stereotype and needs more nuance and detail to more truthfully understand why this man would abandon his unborn child. So as a Black woman, the student said she was just tired of this, seeing this narrative, this trope of absent Black fathers. Um, in the process of creating this bold narrative and trying to make something happen via background story and action, this white student stumbled over the construction of racial identity and the pitfalls of stereotypical imagery. And that is the whole point of the class. Let them fall and let them get back up again. Um, in this class, I currently use two books, Writing the Other, A Practical Approach by Nisi Shaw and Cynthia Ward, and A Stranger's Journey, Race, Identity, and Narrative Craft in Writing by David Murrow, which offers a more reflective vision and process of writing about racialized identities. While Shaw and Ward offer specific terminology in writing about otherness and suggest writing exercises designed to kind of jostle the writer's perceptions, Mira uh, shares his own personal experiences as a writer and advocates for a systematic approach that engages Aristotelian and a realistic writing that centers on character motivation, uh, psychology, given circumstances, obstacles, conflict, climactic structure, and resolution. Shaw and Ward introduce really important concepts such as the unmarked state, roars, which is spelled R-O-A-R-R-S, all capitals, parallax and resonance. Now the unmarked state is the universal identity that conjures broad and flexible images in the mind of a reader. A reader does not begin to add assumptions or specific meaning to this identity. Uh, the authors argue that this identity is, as you might expect, white, male, straight, able-bodied and unmarried. One of the first exercises we do in this class um, is to explore the boundaries of this unmarked state, asking students to imagine the difference between a character with this said universal identity crossing a river versus a character with one or more of their own personal attributes, which is not part of the unmarked state, um, also crossing that river. So a Latina student this semester said that she felt if a Latina character was crossing a river in a storyline, the audience or reader might assume she was an undocumented migrant crossing into the United States. And she was not the only Latina Latinx student to, to share that perspective. Um, a white female student suggested that if a character like herself was crossing a river, the audience might expect that she needs help or she's being chased by men. So exercises like these 
help students become aware of their own ROARS trait, which stands for race, orientation, age, race, religion, and sexuality. And to see how these traits are culturally constructed and read, while more advanced writing exercises begin to ask students to begin exploring how the adjustment of a ROARS trait may impact the character's view of what is considered normal in their world and how they might even function in that said world, which uh, the authors call parallax. Um, so how does a character perceive the world differently when you begin to alter the makeup of their ROARS traits? Um, so one exercise they suggest is that the students take a scene that they know really well from a, a TV show or a film or a play they've read and to change one Roar's trait in a character and to see how that might change the dialogue, the impact, the emotional connections, the actions um, of that particular scene. Um, another more playful exercise they suggest is having the characters improvise a scene where two characters engage each other, one character is trying to return another character's wallet, but to add different traits, such as perhaps the wallet holder um, has amnesia, or the other character is a pregnant banker. Um, and so to really kind of play in some ways joyfully with these ideas of taking different traits and seeing how it impacts um, action. So ultimately, Shaw and Ward um, their approach leads students through a process in which, through diverse perspectives, students discover resonances, possible alliances between characters across their differences. So they offer uh, uh, examples in novels and short stories when perhaps characters of different Roar's traits find themselves really allied, perhaps, in certain challenges with the social structure at hand. Um, and that students find that very helpful to their understanding of, of humanity. Um, Shaw and Ward seek to jostle the creative writer's sense of stability, boundaries and habits of identities that are not their own and to parse out the complex combinations of identity traits that we all possess. Mira, on the other hand, seeks to help students develop a thread of their own experience as writers of diverse identities. For instance, in his series of short essays that constitute this book, he argues that writers of color may require a different set of tools than their white counterparts. He quotes Audre Lorde as he suggests that the tools of the master cannot dismantle the master's house. In his vision of writing, writers must dig where it hurts. They must dig into secrets, discomfort, and problems. And in cases of writers of color, these spaces are, awfully, are often racially charged. He also discusses the specific challenges of writers of color, as well as white writers, in creating globally truthful stories when their own reading and education has been predominantly devoid of three-dimensional characters of color, uh, which is something I think we kind of heard in the last um, paper as well. Um, certain intriguing aspects appear in Mira's system, given that he references Joseph Campbell, a Western derived archetypal system, as well as Aristotelian dramatic structure. But this kind of transcultural sharing is part of his vision of writing that expands beyond geographical and identity boundaries and historic uh, exclusions. So to kind of wrap up this talk, I want to share two brief sections of a poem by a Samoan female student from last year. Um, the final project of this class requires that students um, choose um, a very specific form of difference from themselves and explore otherness through the creation of a short story, poem, or dramatic scene. Um, in this poem titled Manava, to be published in Frontiers, a women's studies journal, this female student sought to explore the experiences of a Samoan young man growing up in an abusive household, focusing on the moment he chooses how to express his developing masculinity to make peace or to make war. So I thought this was really an exciting moment for this female student to really explore what's it like to be a young man in an abusive household and you're under pressure, what kind of man are you going to be? And I, I just was really excited by this. And I want to mention too, before we look at the poem that 
Um, I've also been really excited by Catherine von Stockton's work and her recent book, Genders. Um, she's my dean, so I have to kind of, I have to mention her, but really, it really applies because she argues that gender is inherently shaped by race. And so as many races there are out there, there are that many genders. And so I feel that that particular perspective on the intersectionality between race and gender um, really applies to this poem. So in a male voice, the student writes about this intense fight her male character has with her father. And I'm going to just read the English version, but you can see some of the Samoan wording in the chat. Um, so my parents' love, my mother's harsh teachings, and my father's silent lashings, I have always loathed, and yet I deserve them. But as I got older, those beatings turned into words, words that are disguised as weapons, words coming out of people I love, words that touch places that the belt or the stick that holds the sliding door in place can never touch. These are the times I wish I could get the back the beatings. Instead, I am left in anguish, fighting back tears, keeping my head down because that last bit of confidence I had is gone. And then as the poem goes on, um, he begins to think about his sister and his sister's belief in himself. Um, and perhaps he thinks he has to protect his sister from this abusive household. So at the end of the poem, the character decides not to physically or verbally lash out at his father, um, despite his training to do so. So the end of the poem is this last section. Sole, you good? I look up and he's looking at me confused. But the more I look at him, the more I see myself, my old self. Before I speak, I calm myself down. Shh, manava, or breath. Uchi, don't be talking that shit again and be careful out there. As I said this, I turned away and I turned around and walked away. My mom was right. It's easy. And the Samoan is at the end and much better uh, phrase, of course, uh, in the Samoan. Um, but anyway, so that's what I had to share um, about this class and it's currently ongoing and um, it's been exciting and I'll look forward to any thoughts you have about how I could make it better. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, that was great. Um... Again, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, you know, feel free to send them in the chat. Um, I'll make sure to address them if any questions are posted there. Um, our final speaker for today um, is Amy Nishimura. Uh, let me read her short bio really quickly. Uh, Amy Nishimura is a teacher slash scholar slash student who lives in Uwanu, but normally works in Kapole, Oahu. She is a professor in the humanities division at the University of Hawaii, West Oahu. Um, Amy's presentation today is titled Creating Subjectivities and Critical Inquiry. Where is the American in the ethnic? Um, and so as soon as I give you co-host privileges, Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Um... Actually, if you could just put up that link I sent you from Hawaii Council for the Humanities, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, uh, just in the just in the chat. Um, or on the like, screen. Or just yeah, post on it the up on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Mahalo. Um, aloha kako, everyone. I'm zooming in from Nuuanu today on the island of Oahu. Um, I've lived on the island of Oahu for about 14 years now. Prior to that, I lived on the continent various states, um, Long Island, New York, where I taught at Stony Brook. Um, I've also taught at University of Oregon, where I received the PhD, um, and at Bellevue Community College in Washington State. So I can relate to the idea of teaching at a predominantly white institution. Although since I've moved back um, to Hawaii, I find that given so many controversies, especially because of TMT, um, on the surface, we are an institution that values diversity, or at least we say we value diversity, but um, there are various dichotomies at work and tensions at play. So I'll be focusing on a class that I co-taught with a colleague. His name is Dr. Keolani Cook in the history division um, or concentration in the humanities division. 
And the title of that course was called History and Literature of Civil Disobedience. Um, I wanted to thank Mike for moderating this session and pulling us together. I know that he has a lot to contribute and say, and I'm looking forward to learning from him, especially given the fact that his parents are activists. They were involved in Waiohole Waikane and involved in Ole TNT on Mauna Kea. I also want to thank my panelists today. I appreciate your presentations, um, especially because the work that we do, intersectionality, anti-racist curriculum, critical race theory right now especially is emotionally exhausting. Um, I know it is for me. I've been reading a lot of news articles from the New York Times, the Washington Post, and I think one recent article I read, it said why critical race theory is dangerous without any actual context. Um, so trying to continue these conversations, whether with one another, um, with family and friends, with our students in the classroom, trying to engage them and push these conversations forward is draining. Um, so thank you for your work. And I, I definitely relate to many points that you made in terms of teaching. So to give context to um, the class that I just wanna mention briefly, I had the privilege of going to an art installation at Honolulu Museum of Art earlier this week. I think this was on Monday. And a lot of Kanako EV artists um, did great installations. One was on houselessness in Hawaii. Another was on Mauna Kea specifically and focused in on the 39 kupuna who were arrested. Um, he portrayed, you know, poster board photos of the kupuna who were arrested. And I wanted to read and share a description of his work. His name is Kapulani Langra. On the 7th of January, 1895, on the slopes of Leahi, over 300 Koa Aloha Aina fought the provisional government to return Queen Liliuokalani back to her throne from Leahi to Mo'ili'ili, to Maumai, and finally to Nu'uanu, our Lahui stood for Aloha Aina. On the 16th of July, 2019, on the slopes of Mauna Kea, over 100 Koa Aloha Aina stood for the protection of Mauna Kea against the desecration of the building of the 30 meter telescope. Eight Koa Aloha Aina chained to the cattle guard in front of them Kupuna, willing to be the first to stand against law enforcement. On the 18th of July, 2019, on the Mauna Kea Access Road, over a thousand Koa Aloha Aina stood in respectful silence as 39 Kupuna were arrested by police dressed in riot gear. On that same day, Governor David Ige signed an emergency proclamation to remove Kanako Ivi from our own Aina. E ihu ana o luna, e pi ana o lalo, e hui ana na moku, e ku ana kapaia. That which is above shall be brought down, that which is below shall be lifted up. The island shall be unified, the wall shall stand upright. So again, I just wanted to give a little bit of context because the course that I co-taught with Dr. Keolani Cook um, focused specifically on Ole TMT, what happened, who were some of the organizers, who were on the front lines. Um, Dr. Cook was on the front lines on the very first day with his friends and other kia'i or protectors. And so his portion of the class focused on bringing in some of the organizers, some of the activists, um, the people who were part of the communication logistics, and he interviewed them. These people included Andre Perez, Ilima Long. Um, I think he tried to get Kalekoa Kaeo, who was arrested, has been arrested a few times, fighting for land rights. Um, and the students really resonated with the material, resonated with the speakers. Initially, we wanted it to be in person. We wanted to model a kind of intersectionality, myself being a settler ally um, and Kea being indigenous to Hawaii. But given COVID, we had to move it to an online platform and we did our best to make it work. Um, my portion of the class focused on emotional and invisible labor. How do we talk about that? Um, what are labor rights, given that I'm a union rep for um, the University of Hawaii? and part of the negotiating team. 
And another facet of the course was just trying to move away from standards, traditional standards of assignment making, assignment bridging. We had them create a civil rights campaign with some specific parameters. We had them keep a journal that was their midterm. Initially, the page limit was about 12 pages, but they were so, I guess, interested in some of the topic and subject material that some of them wrote 30 pages. We had them write about COVID. We had them write about COVID in relation to social justice. Um, what are some of the social equity issues that we need to address post COVID, right, as we're trying to deal with now. Um, we had them write erasure poems, found poems, and we sort of did away with the assessment industrial complex because we wanted them to write as vulnerable human beings who were dealing with the pandemic. Um, and we also had them create their own final exam questions, which were quite interesting. Again, moving back to ideas of what is resistance, what is protest? What does it mean to work on an anti-racist curriculum? Um, and that's currently where I'm at. I'm trying to think about, you know, what else can I do to move the conversation forward? What other types of classes can I create for students? So one that I'll be teaching next spring is called um, Ethnicity, Literature, Race, and Film. So focusing on racism through literature and film but I'm also having difficulty trying to think about specific um, texts to use because our students I'm finding are distraught, right, from the pandemic, the ongoing issues that stem from the pandemic. I'm finding their attention spans maybe aren't as long as they used to be. So do I move to digital platform sites like Hyperallergic and Long Reads? Do I have them read full length novels? I'm not sure yet. Um, but another class that I've designed is Women Writers and Dissent. So I'm looking forward to teaching that possibly in the fall. Um, I think I'll end there. I had, I asked Mike to put up the Try Think for Hawaii Council for the Humanities because they are an inspiring organization. I've attended many of their workshops and poetry sessions, and it is open to the public. So that is another venue or a resource that I'll be sharing with my students and encouraging them to attend. Some of their presentations last year focused on Mauna Kea specifically, and they have really great, great moderators, one of them being Ila Malong. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, I copied the, the link that we, we just shared as a share screen, it's in the chat. Um, that's, that, that concludes our pr um, presentations part of our roundtable. Um, but now I'd love to open it up to, to everyone, um, presenters and audiences alike. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can unmute yourself and ask them directly, or you can post them in the chat and I can kind of address them. So maybe just a, a minute or so to just kind of recalibrate our minds from all of these things that we're like talk, thinking about. Um, and so you know, while you, you all are kind of considering questions, maybe, maybe I can get us started. Um, first of all, I, you know, I enjoyed all of the presentations. I think that under, underneath all of these different pedagogical examples and experiences, there's the same kind of consistent conviction for you know, good work and for you know, you know, bringing intersectionality and imp the importance of, you know, of, of identity, but not just identity, but in terms of enacting social justice, you know, I think that's, that's underneath every single one of the, 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 the presentations. So I think that, you know, I, I'm really excited in terms of, you know, the, just not just the work that we've, that you've already shared with us, but like the, how this work will continue to grow and, and whatnot. So maybe my first question would be, um, for um, uh, Kimberly, um, in terms of, I know um, as, as your position kind of situates yourself, you know, you're in this, you're in a, you're in a lot of different roles, you know, you're, you're teaching ethnic studies, you're teaching theater studies. And I thought it was really interesting um, that you kind of highlighted 
the value of, of creative writing across these different kinds of fields. And I think that in that curricular way, you know, I think in, in Amy's presentation as well, just the inclusion of found poetry, erasure poetry. And I think that, you know, especially in this kind of world where we really want to make sure that, you know, we allow students to, to speak, right? And, and, you know, not just for their, their own voices, but for voices that need to be heard. Um, so I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about just, you know, how, how you found, um, you know, creative, teaching creative writing in not creative writing classes. Great, thank you so much for that question. You know, it's, um, it's been very interesting to see the different responses to the students, because as you can imagine, ethnic studies students are, are they're just very different than theater st students, especially if they're conservatory kind of focused theater students, like many of the students I, I have are, you know, I mean, that means that they had the singing lessons, the dance lessons. I mean, it's a whole different kind of level of access, professional aspirations. Um, and of course, there's just a very clear demographic difference between the groups. Um, but what I have found really seems to help the students, again, assist their sharing. You know, I think that a lot of times, um, people, students are just not as always as um, kind of aware of the signals that they're giving off to other people, assumptions they're making. Um, it just like I mentioned in the paper, I think that's probably one of the most overt <laughs> examples I saw when there was a, a trope, or a theme or an image of an absent black father and the white student just didn't, it was essential to her. She wanted to write about a young man growing up without a father who was biracial. So therefore the father had to be absent. And it didn't, it didn't occur to her that that had other implications. It just, it was, it was like a, an action. It needed to happen to make her action happen. And, you know, I, I was intrigued that another student picked up on it, you know, really, really quickly. Um, I, I do have another case where a student um, interesting, a lot of students want to talk about sexuality. I find that interesting. And I think sometimes they're still a little uncomfortable to want to choose race as an otherness. They'd rather talk about someone who, if they're gay, they'd rather explore the other side of it or vice versa. I, I'm not sure why that is. Um, but I do have a student who is, you know, identifies as straight, but wants to write about a, a female student who's bisexual, who wants to tell her rather controlling boyfriend. And it's been really interesting to see how she kind of worked it out so that the argument itself is kind of very logical and, and, and kind of very kind of full complete sentences and it makes sense. But then another student who actually is gay <laughs> wrote said, hey, you know, if you're telling, if you're coming out to someone you're intimate with, and it's, it's going to change the relationship, their understanding of you, their own questioning of what you've been sharing these two years, as the story says, it's a two-year relationship. There's going to be a lot more than this. And so I think in that way, it's really just getting students to have the chance to talk. And since they're working in the space of the imaginary, there's just a little bit more allowance, I think, for making mistakes, right, and, and assuming things. Um, so I do think that's been one of the great things of this class is just giving them that space that's creative and, and, and not say as real to them. I mean, it's real to them, but it's not say, you know, you know what I'm saying is it, it gives them a space to kind of practice. Um, and I think that's been great. I, I actually do believe that students who are white should within the safety of a classroom be allowed to explore a black character. I think a black actor should explore the, the experiences of a white character. I, I, not everyone agrees with that, but I'm hoping that this class might give students a chance to at least experience that trying. Thank you, yeah. Um, we have a little comment in the, in the chat Stormy where I am, so connection is sketchy, but so appreciate these presentations. So many notes to take to my US Lit cultural studies and comp courses immediately. Thank you. Okay, well, that was more of a praise than a question, but thank you, Robin. Um, any other questions from anyone in the audience or any of the panelists? Like, do you have questions for each other? Yeah. Well, I, I want to ask Miguel about A Raisin in the Sun. I mean, it's a play that I, I actually do teach often because it's just such a classic. And I, one thing that I know when, when I've led students through it and what I appreciate about your approach was that 
the play itself is very melodramatic, right? It's played for melodrama. I've actually seen this performed and it's like the high points are the high points, right? And I think when I've taught it, they're often, the students are very concerned about the relationships, you know, particularly the gendered relationships and more poor Benita and how she starts strong in the play and then she seems like she's just kind of dismissed. And, and I think some of the students are very aware of the relationships between the characters. But I appreciate about yours is, is how you kind of grounded it more in kind of social context. And I was wondering like, if you could talk a bit how you, you eventually do, if you do get the chance to kind of integrate those emotional relationships between the characters and issues of love and, and who does mama love best and you know, all those kind of things. I think students tend to want to pick up on because they all know family dynamics. And, and, but yet what you were doing was saying, no, let's not just focus on that. Let's, let's look at something more historical. So I was just wondering how you balance that. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I, I think the, I, I wanna, I wanna let the students work their way into it. I require my, I use this for my introduction to literature courses that I ta I've taught. So like, it's their, it's their way they're exploring drama. So the students have to act out a scene as part of the requirement for their flip teaching. And uh, and so we talk about we talk about what's appropriate and not appropriate, and and students gravitate toward these exact emotional connections because there's a kind of safeness in speaking to this, right? So the, the Benny suitors, for example, the discussion between Joseph versus George is always a very popular part for the student to get into, right? They shy away from the larger historical context, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's part of the power of the of the drama, right? That it it rotates us around that wheel so we feel it all. So like I I I think that the the students do get a chance they get a chance to explore it in the performative aspect of learning how, what a play is, um, and at the same time that they're learning to really situate those choices inside that larger historical context, and I think that's really the, the power of the play. Like you said, it is uberly melodramatic, which is why I use it to introduce drama. Right? It does it does a great job of being dramatic. Right? <laughs> Yeah, so that's so I, I think it does have a home and it's something that we don't we have less work to do on because the students pull toward there and it and, and that's part of this part of the play strength why I think it's such a good how to read a play play. <laughs> uh, so I have a question for maybe all of you um, because but I because I was thinking about um, how important it is to change the frame of what students are producing and engage their creativity and imagination. Um, and then Amy, you were saying you're not sure about um, the role of reading for, for some of our students. Um, or, you know, exactly what do we want, what do we want them to read? So I was wondering, um, like, I guess for Miguel, like, what else do they read? Do they read things sort of like, on their own to um, to develop those muscles that you've that you've helped them work on, um, and Amy, you know, yeah. What do you think would be the most powerful thing they're reading? And Kimberly, I was very interested. For example, like what were the things that um, the poet had read? Because that was an amazing, um, a really amazing poem. So I'm wondering how what the role of reading is in reimagining and writing creatively. Sorry, before we get started, I wanted to invite Carrie. Um, maybe feel free to unmute yourself as well. Carrie teaches in the composition program at UH West Oahu. And I'm, I'm curious to know what Carrie has to say as well about reading and our students, if, if you want, Carrie. And Mike, if, if you want to address Janice, great question. That, that'd be good too. Okay, well, I, I, can, I can maybe st start off in terms of that. Um, in terms of reading, you know, like, so for example, I'm teaching a contemporary Pacific literature class this semester. And, you know, in, in my opinion, there's, you know, there's, there's certain kind of canonical works that we, we all kind of need exposure to, like um, the Samoan writer, Albert Wendt, uh, you know, Fijian author um, Epili Haofa, um, the Hawaiian writer and activist scholar Hanani K. Trask, 
Um, but there's also a lot of other kinds of works that I think are you know, really interesting for, for, to expose students to. Um, so for example, one of the last works that we kind of included in, in our semester was a graphic novel um, by a Hawaiian um, writer. He's actually a, a cop by trade. <laughs> But he writes these he writes these um these graphic novels about Hawaiian and Pacific superheroes, and so there it's it's the same kind of tropes of superhero tropes you know whether we're talking like Marvel or DC, but they're all bound in a place based kind of landscape full with actual Hawaiian language and Samoan language, and so I think that you know. A lot of the students were kind of taken kind of by surprise, you know, because they have certain kinds of expectations of what literature is. And so, you know, I think that, you know, while many of them might have read that if they just, if it happened to pass them by, I think having to read it in a literature class kind of changes those expectations. Or maybe for some of them, they really struggled because they were trying to read it like they read literature. And some of the other ones were just like, wow, you know, like I never even thought about like, that stories and, and, and especially just kind of discourse that's in non-academic language can still be approached with a literary lens and a cultural studies kind of lens. And so, um, you know, I, 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 for, on my part, you know, I try to kind of just, not that I'm trying to force all of these random things down their throats or whatever, but I do try to give them as, you know, varied of a, of a of a kind of array as, as much as possible, just because you, you never know, at least from a student's perspective, what single work might actually, you know, resound and resonate with the student. So, you know, I, I don't think it's irresponsible for us to think, oh, this is too hard for a student, or this is too easy for a student, because, you know, we don't know. We, but the student that we might think might be struggling might, you know, they, they might read Sartre and just like eat it up because I don't know, they just, they're really into that stuff. Like, you know, before they were a student, they were kind of a, a stoner who thinks about this kind of stuff anyways. I don't know, you know, <laughs> but I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's productive for us to kind of over assume from our students. Um, but that's, that, you know, that's, that's my kind of two cents in terms of, you know, what I assign to the students. Oh, Miguel, no exit has pandemic power. <laughs> Yeah, and then you know we have like Camus with wrote the plague and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, like you know, to, to kind of defer back to Janet's question, like Kimberly, Amy, or Miguel, like do you have any kind of comments on, on, on in terms of reading and, and those kinds of things? That um that semester that this this student Rachel was in, um, they we did quite a bit with African American theater actually, and they wrote um for color girls. Um, who considered suicide when the rainbow is not enough and um, how they had read some August Wilson. So I think that really, you know, theater, of course, it's, it's my own background. So it's like I assign theater, right? But I think it does actually help with some of the kind of more performative aspects of poems. And I have to say that a lot of the students who wrote poems, they were very performative poems, which excited me. So I thought that was fun. Um, I've also made a commitment this year to really try to get more contemporary works um, they're kind of hot off the press. I figure that might excite some of the more of the theater students who want to enter into the profession. I did assign this semester for this class, um, which I don't know if I would do again, but it's Slave Play by Jeremy O. Harris. Um, it's very sexual. I mean, it's all about sexual fantasy, but I thought, well, you ought to try it. And, you know, I'm, I'm in Utah. <laughs> Why not give it a try? See what happens. And I have to say, I've been really surprised by how much the students really kind of got the sexual fantasy stuff. And we're not offended, we're not concerned because again, they were able to ground it in race and gender and class and all in the history of slavery in the plantation world. And um, so I think the students really are quite, really obviously quite capable of reading really challenging works and seeing all the different historical contexts as Miguel has pointed out, the historical context and themes um, that kind of underride this, this kind of intimate moment. Yeah, I have to say, I am often shocked by how well students are able to deal with a pretty big range of, of texts. And I agree with you, Mike, that I try to really throw a lot of 
a pretty big range of things at them. And I'm surprised sometimes what they, what they really get. <laughs> Other questions for Janet or for Kimberly or Amy or Miguel? Um, I'd like to ask a question, just throw it out to the panel if that's okay. Sure. Sure. Um, it, it, cause it, it, it was going along with what Kimberly was talking about because I have students perform a scene from Raisin in the Sun and I've got to be very careful because I, I want to make sure students make choices that aren't offensive by their by the nature of it, right? Since I'm using it as an introductory drama. So I'm just wondering what, what, what do you, how do you guys approach that? Something that Kimberly mentioned about can you have a, can you have a non, can you have, can you do an August Wilson play when there are no actors to play any of the roles that meet the, the intended parts, right? So I, I'm just very curious. How you guys would approach that, given that specific of having students act out a scene? How do you? How would you guys approach those moments? I, I'm I'm going to defer to Kimberly, but for me, that would mean a lot of context, right? A lot of explanation, um, what certain terminology means. What does it mean to enact this when there aren't principal people who in the class, etc. So yeah, context is big for me. I think a lot of it depends, of course, on the outcome. You know, it's like, as I always tell students, we would not sell tickets to this. I mean, we would not, this is not for public performance. This is for within our little safe space that we hopefully have created. That is just for us. It's an exploration. Now that said, that hasn't always worked over like in musical theater. And we had a case recently where a role had been originated by an African-American performer that wasn't specifically written for an African-American performer. And in this class setting, someone who was not African-American performed that particular part just within a class activity. And that caused a lot of bad feeling. I mean, there, it actually went all the way up, you know, the complaints. And so I think, I mean, I think it, it, a lot of it's just communication and the expectations that you set for the students. Um, but yeah, I have no, there's no easy answer to it. There's absolutely no easy answer to this. And, and I do worry about someday, perhaps someone in my class, even within this kind of writing space that doesn't really go anywhere besides just our classroom, you know, maybe someday someone will have an issue. You know, I'll have to grapple with that. I have not had people act out um, liter scenes in literature or plays. I haven't really read plays with, um, with my students. Um, however, I do know that in our, um, in our drama department, it sure is difficult, um, you know, to try to bring diverse playwrights into, um, the performance space because of this concern um, about offending people when when most of the students cannot play the diverse parts. But um, one of my students is having this fantasy about like um, throwing like a tome about this big of women playwrights onto one of the um, professor's desks because they they've said things like, you know, in class, like, well, there just aren't any women playwrights that we want to use. And um, anyway, so it certainly is a pretty big issue in, at, our, at our university in the drama department. Um, yeah. I, I put in the chat a play that might be fun to look at. It's a Thanksgiving play by Larissa Fasthorst, who's an indigenous writer. And of course, she, her, like herself, it's hard to get your works produced. I actually had suggested doing a, a, a Susan Soonhee Stanton play, but there was one Filipino role. And so I said, we can't do it. You <laughs> can't do it. And but anyways, this play, the Thanksgiving play, I think was maybe a response to that challenge for playwrights having wanting to write plays about people of color without people of color actually in them. And it's about four white people trying to do a Thanksgiving play. And it's 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 a it's a dark humor, right? Because they can't, <laughs> you know, and we shouldn't be doing Thanksgiving plays anyways, which is the whole ironic, you know, twist of that. And and the and the humor of it is that 
this woman decided that we can do it if we find a Native American actor to be in this Thanksgiving play. But then of course she finds out the person's not Native American. You know, just, just had a Native American headshot, you know, Native American styled headshot. <laughs> that was it. So that might be a play to look at if you're concerned, if you wanna look at issues of indigeneity, but you, you don't have any indigenous people in the class. Thank you. And my student thanks you too, because I'm gonna pass that right on to her actually. Okay, we have like about five minutes left or, you know, for our schedule kind of, um, for the schedule for this session. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just um, stop to thank all of the presenters today and everyone who's kind of logged on and kind of participated. Um, this is a wonderful session. You know, I, I'm, I'm really happy with all of the, the, you know, the conversations that we were able to have. Um, I will end the, the recording now, um, but I will stick around, you know, and I, I hope at least some of you will stick around just to talk story and just be able to kind of like, you know, connect and, you know, and just kind of unwind a little bit. So again, thank you everyone for the panel. Um, and um, I hope to talk story with you guys more. <laughs>